Thank you everybody for being here tonight, this afternoon. Uh, just a couple of quick announcements. We have Kaylin from Stably today that's doing some photography for us. Uh, so Stably is a local um, stable coin organization uh, based down at Pier 66. So if you aren't familiar with them, uh, check them out. And then thanks to IBM for sponsorship of the snacks and water, which we all always greatly appreciate. Um, I think you've all been here, so you know the lay of the, the land. Uh, just a reminder, doors lock at six, so please don't leave anything here, because it'll be stuck. Um, so it is my pleasure to be able to introduce Clive, is it Bolton? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so Clive has been an active community member uh, working in the Hyperledger since uh, early 2017. Uh, and he has a deep engineering and domain background in computer systems, mainly applied to supply chain enterprise application software. His career has crisscrossed privacy and confidentiality from army signals to interfacing US mints with FBI tracking systems. Pretty cool. Um, on one of the first Silicon Valley teams to start moving Windows software to the web by changing the system manager to MSIE based, which brought up P and C issues in the business model, leading into research engineering and startups. He's currently an architect who tracks the agoric and capabilities work of Mark S. Miller and is prototyping a plugin for blockchain apps in collaboration with the Federated Wiki project led by Ward Cunningham. He learned by building that microservices and e-commerce is much simpler underpinned by blockchain consensus, that privacy and confidentiality needs to be evaluated in underlying platforms. So today he will be sharing a white paper that he's been working on with the um, architecture working group under Hyperledger called Towards the Evaluation of Privacy and Confidentiality in Hyperledger Platforms. So Clive, thank you so much for being here and cool. looking forward to it. Thank you. Awesome. Okay, well, I learned from Google De De Devrel to uh, take a photo, so okay. hopefully it would be just, whoops. I think I need to make some adjustments here. Oh, nice. Got you all. Thank you. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, the paper is actually titled The Evaluation of Privacy and Confidentiality in Hyperledger uh, Platforms. But I just wanted to frame it to talk because it's not finished yet. It's really a draft paper. And it's underway, and uh, we've been working on this for uh, I think about uh, at least 18 months, probably a little bit longer than that now because time goes on. And <clears throat> generally speaking, we meeting on a uh, bi weekly basis, which is a lot of the high budget meetups are along those lines, and then also doing somewhat sort of a quarterly face to face meeting. You fly down to Cisco or Fujitsu or Intel or somewhere like that and just Oracle have some um, and just you can sort of go so far on the web and then you need to have a face to face so <clears throat> this is kind of where we are right now but the paper is about to, it's 26 pages probably 25 without the table of contents so I kind of have uh, prepared some slides where I kind of just cherry picked a few things to present to kind of orient us I have a uh, uh, prepared and uh, there's, a, there's a, a deck online so you can look at it afterwards. There's also a copy of a bitly link that you can see up here uh, that links to a PDF which is a current snapshot of the paper. Um, and so I'm just going to hop back and forth between my, my slide which I think is going to and then I'm sort of going to talk more about how, uh, how the evaluation uh, can be done or has, or has been approached and then sort of end by not actually going into the individual projects because those are you've probably already got something in mind or you're either going to look at them all or you've already got some product you're already working on and so that material is already there and so it but I think it's more valuable to to look at how how we actually got to this point and it gives you a lot of hopefully um, gives you a lot of uh, context to look at not only Hyperledger but probably other blockchain projects as well. Okay, enough of that intro. So this talk, uh, this is what was in the, uh, the outline. Um, okay, how the, how, how the architecture 
PNC group went uh, track went about developing goals for the paper, the methods of analysis, commonly used technologies, uh, and the ever evolving uh, the ever evolving evaluation of uh, privacy and confidentiality. Because it doesn't stop. Because new technologies keep coming along, such as uh, zk proofs. So not in this talk, but I thought it may be worthwhile just looking at this is uh, Brian uh, Bellendorf uh, broke down this. Uh, let's see if we can just show this for a moment. This is just a quick one. So um, what do you think? Between Hyperledger and other platforms, other blockchain platforms, and what the major differences? So uh, we have a number of platforms actually within the Hyperledger greenhouse, as we call it. And we use the greenhouse metaphor to try to give, you know, help people understand we have some technologies that are very mature, some technologies that are still starting out, um, but they share the same uh, oxygen, the same air space. They uh, sometimes will cross pollinate each other, right? Um, and so, uh, you know, to talk specifically about some of the, the, the frameworks that we have, uh, Hyperledger Fabric um, was designed to... So, you know what, this is not very loud, so I'm probably going to skip it here, but just give you a little bit of info to say that this, what, he, what he's trying to talk about is that this is Hyperledger, is a, uh, it really has a green edge concept, where different products are growing inside the green edge and they're cross-pollinating. It has a lot of power, it also has a lot of... The other thing he's saying is that fabric is really the, the real sort of like the Rolls Royce. It's on every cloud platform, and it has a lot of um, capabilities to tune it for different networks, networks with a few nodes or networks with many nodes. He's also saying that uh, with Sawtooth. And that's the next product that came along. And what's unique about Sawtooth is you can bring different smart contracting systems to Sawtooth, whereas Fabric's got its own smart contracting system. But what's going on now is because of this greenhouse concept, a piece which is being broken out of Sawtooth and out of Fabric is the ability to bring those um, that, uh, capability to work with different smart contracting systems to Fabric. So you can see that how the cross pollination works inside the greenhouse. Hyperledger Proxy was kind of a project, and it's a little bit more of an experimental platform. So I'm just going to leave that there, and just so you know that you can come back to that. It is a short. Okay. Um, so where does that put us? And why we kind of? I also wanted to really frame why we're here and why this is really relevant, and to kind of like just tune us in a little bit. So this is from the. Um, this is from the IPS uh, meetup in Tokyo just a couple of days ago, this slide. So I think it's kind of interesting that, <clears throat> that most of the time when we think about business systems, they're pretty much all, they've all been centrally based. You know, Web, web 1.0, 2.0, kind of 3.0, we're changing things a little bit. We're going more towards peer-to-peer, uh, uh, -peer, uh, even if it is a permission blockchain. Uh, I'm gonna, I've got another slide to, to illustrate a, a business example here. Um, so things are, things are changing. So we're, we're really moving from the centralized web to decentralized. And really the blockchain is really the, uh, the technology which is helping that move forward. In the same way that uh, Hadoop technologies really help the, the big data move ahead. So um, is privacy and confidentiality uh, relevant then on permission blockchain? Because this is what we're talking about with Hyperledger. So we've got some like uh, simple attacks on DLTs. We've got identity-based blockchain where you can spin up multiple identities and kind of like you know sort of see if you can cheat the system sort of thing. Are we vulnerable? So we're going to talk about some of these things, um, and we can make we can handle uh, things such as making spinning up identities just a little bit difficult to. to trying to head some of those things off and um, by using bi biometrics and so forth. So next thing we've got here is I want to, um, something else which is going on in business, which is why, why blockchain is kind of uh, key here, is uh, 
I didn't realize this until recently, something I picked up on, and that was that uh, Elon Musk's uh, battery factory is actually a collaboration between Panasonic and Elon Musk. Mm -hmm. And so, but what's going on is they've got really like two very, very different business cultures there. And Panasonic is actually embedded inside, inside the uh, Musk's uh, battery factory in Nevada. But they have two completely different business cultures. Uh, this Wall Street Journal article over here showed that you know Elon Musk was like uh, sucking on a on a joint, you know, on a on a conference call, and the Japanese culture is like very buttoned down, completely different than that. And and then also Musk is also like just beating beating up on Panasonic to get them to reduce their prices because he needs lower prices to to get the volumes up on his cars. So so what's going on is they they the this, they have some commonality though, and the commonality is that they both are focused on the production data. But uh, if, when you look at most business systems you can buy, they don't have that capability. They're designed pretty much uh, like this, you know, central systems, and there's, there's no real uh, sharing of data. Whereas I think in Musk's situation, and actually I picked up on something a long time ago, I, he spent some, quite some time, a couple of years at Intel, and more recently, uh, Intel and Cargill, who are uh, members of Hyperledger, uh, are making some, uh, are doing some innovative stuff in their supply chain. I think we're seeing businesses move more towards this uh, embedding one business inside another business, a high level of cooperation, and to get that cooperation, really needs uh, a different type of uh, IT system that blockchain can support. Um, and of course, you know, in the evaluation of healthcare as well, the flow of information is probably going to be quite different. So, the um, the paper then, this is the introduction and goals. The, the target audience for this paper uh, is the general technical audience. This has been written by uh, some guys. Most of the guys, I'd say, probably everybody is uh, is. Uh, I'm not sure how I got into this group, but I guess they needed somebody to. <laughs> to balance it out <laughs> are the, the, the PhDs and the research engineers who are actually um, behind uh, uh, many of the projects. Um, and, um, but specifically, we expect this to be read by people who are familiar with the implementation details, but perhaps not familiar with the detailed um, methods such as creating and analyzing cryptographic tools. Um, a little bit, I have a little bit more here on that. So, um, so the document is intended to educate the reader about potential channels where privacy and confidentiality may be breached through a distributed ledger. So even though it's permissioned, it can still be breached, and we're going to talk about that. Describe the tools and constructs that may be used to evaluate the privacy and confidentiality guarantees claimed by a particular distributed ledger. And three, to analyze current uh, hyperledger technologies re relative to those objectives. Um, so while we pr attempt to provide several examples, our intent is to um, base our analysis on a specific usage, a specific use case. Um, and in this case, it's going to be the trading of liabilities in the supply chain. They actually call it factoring. So there's a little bit of uh, academic um, that gets sprinkled into this, and that's why I needed to to to, to uh, put a PowerPoint in front of this to, to make it more consumable rather than meeting for the whole paper. Um, so um, so the blockchain is used as a system of record for the transactions of a particular community or a consortium. Okay, I think let's, let's go back here. Um, so definitions. Uh, for the purpose of this paper, we're concerned about the protection of information and enforcement of acceptable policies for who has access to what information about blockchain transactions and when they have that, have, a, have, have that access. Owners of the information should be able to control who has access to the information and for what period of time. So if you actually unwrap that, it's quite a lot of business logic that's going on there, all, all about data. Um, Work. 
So, um, in particular, in an ideal world, we'd like to show the users cannot learn information that they're not supposed to know. Uh, this should be done in a, in a uh, provably secure manner, i.e., if someone knows something that they shouldn't, then they can break uh, either some fundamental cryptographic assumption or some assumption we have made about the limitations of participants and adversaries. So adversaries, that sort of takes us you know, to Bitcoin and, and maybe to Ethereum. In the section method for analysis, we define method, a method that we can use for evaluating properties of blockchain platforms. Okay, so, oops. So, um, confidentiality for the paranoid. Mm -hmm. So, uh, side channels, these represent a, uh, <coughs> I'm going to bounce through the paper a little bit, so bear with me, it should come together. Mm -hmm. Side channels represent a second and far less obvious form of exposing confidential information. For example, in Bitcoin, it uses addresses for transactions which in theory provide an anonymity for transactions. However, correlation between the transactions on the address and activity in exchange often enable disclosure of the actual identity of the address of the owner. So, one thing is we, we use in signals, like, I can up through army signals, if we, if we can look at enough information for a, enough period of time, uh, we, can glean, uh, we can glean identities and all sorts of things from that. So oftentimes we kind of uh, want to switch the radio on, transmit, and then switch it off as quickly as possible to reduce that. Um, that's probably not what you do in the business system, though. Uh, <clears throat> even systems designed for confidential transactions can expose information through side channels, mm -hmm. and uh, so there was this site there about Zcash. Um, so let's just look at a little bit more information there. Um, Okay, so <clears throat> there's a section summary here, and that is it's nearly impossible to prevent all information leakage in any internet-based computation. Uh, our intent in this paper is to provide the readers uh, with some tools for evaluating what information is leaked and how to balance the cost of prevention versus the cost of the leakage trade-offs. So the CTO stuff, that's really what a CTO is up to, usually is, is trying to figure out is to do the trade-offs, except if you're in a small company, which case you probably also coding everything. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so the deep use case that the paper refers to is supply chain factoring. Mm -hmm. You can kind of think of that as really like a, um, I think probably like a, a really uh, a good online SAP, Oracle, Amazon type ordering system back off the system. The current practice places all control of data under a single organization, back to the, uh, the IPFS analogy I was drawing on with, uh, uh, with Elon Musk and the batteries. But with blockchain solutions, the data is potentially shared, uh, or will be, unless it's well managed. So that's where we need to put those permission controls in to try and put some uh, restriction there so we can, and, <coughs> okay. Let's see what I'm linking to here. Okay, so. so there is a contract between the seller and the buyer that reflects a commitment to future payment. In practice, this may include uh, details of exchange of goods, purchase order, shipping information. Uh, initially, details of the contract are available exclusively to the seller and the buyer. However, the existence of the contract must be recorded for use of the interested parties. So a lot of that's going on, especially uh, especially, say, in UK banking and maybe hospitals where you need to share records, but probably uh, it's time-based share. They get shared after everything's kind of settled down. Um, at some point, the seller may choose to disclose the existence of the contract and some of the details to a specific, a specific uh, collection of factors. Only these factors chosen by the seller may see the information and the seller exposes about the contract. Okay. 
each factor may uh, create a bid for the for the contract. Details of the bid may be only known to the factor and the seller. However, the factor must commit to the bid. Um, so perhaps this is a little bit more like Wall Street-ish, mm -hmm. a little bit sort of like financially. The seller may choose one bid and execute a transfer of ownership um, generated the bid was selected. At this point, winning factor uh, makes the all information about the contract. After handoff, the original seller may look no longer see changes to the contract or make modifications to it. Um, okay. Functional requirements. Um, so these were really um, particularly uh, usage suggests several generation general functional requirements for privacy and confidentiality. So what the paper really says here is that describing everything about privacy and confidentiality is really in depth and open to some um, uh, uh, some discussion and some. But this is what the paper tries to go for. Uh, participants have the ability to, con uh, to keep data about the transactions confidential, entitlement to data access control rights. This may include the ability to hide the existence of objects like the contract. Participants have the ability to choose when and with whom to disclose the data. Participants have the ability to selectively disclose parts of the data with chosen parties. And the right to disclose information is transferred with, um, with ownership transfer. So, um, I, I remember I added this in, but I put it on the way in on the bus. I couldn't remember why. But <laughs> <laughs> so I, I just wanted to kind of like just keep uh, elevating to us, you know, that there are side channel issues um, how, with uh, how somebody could steal my information. So the method for analysis, um, the factor supply usage described in the previous section shows the potential complexity of information access policies for even relatively simple usages. Ad hoc methods for evaluating the preservation of confidentiality provided by specific blockchain platform can lead to incomplete and effect ineffective analysis. We would like to propose a more formal method for evaluating whether a blockchain platform meets the functional requirements for usage. Our proposal, which is the paper, consists of a formal definition of adversarial models and a method for explicitly capturing a functional requirement using a cryptographic game. So I think in the, we've probably all read the, uh, the, the, the Bitcoin paper or are aware of it. So what we're doing here is we're, we're not going down that path, we're going down a path which is specific for permission blockchain. And so the examples in the paper um, are in that mode. Um, we're going to add something into the paper here. I mentioned this draft in, in to help people uh, correctly pick uh, what is their adversarial model inside their, you know, problem in their business use case. So <clears throat> the. Um, we do have the Byzantine adversary. Um, we've got uh, selective Byzantine adversary. We've got an adaptive crash fault tolerance. And we've got the honest but curious mm -hmm. adversary. Um, so what that kind of boils down to is who can see all the communications, who knows when a message is sent, who can look at the traffic, do, does not see any of the messages controlled by the adversary. Um, I'm not sure I'm doing a great job there, but I'm going to come back to this reference system model, which I think ties it together. So, because that's, uh, okay, so here's how we move from like the academic to the, pro to the product, okay. We, we use something called a reference system model. It can be very difficult to properly analyze privacy and confidentiality in a rigorous way um, to the complexity of blockchain systems. Proving properties of blockchain systems in settings that involve real world things like continuous time and outside influences can be extremely difficult or outright impossible. So one way to analyze the privacy and confidentiality property distributed ledgers is to consider a reference model. In this context, a reference model is a construct for the analysis and is not intended to be a practical system. 
So we're actually going to introduce something called the, the ideal system. So we kind of like cheat a little bit. I'm sure like, uh, I remember taking some pretty advanced CS classes and the professor got to like this big old number on the board and just kind of called it one. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and then we, we use that uh, to, as a, as a, you know, to complete the proof. Well, so we're going to use a, a simple or an ideal system to, 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 okay. So how does the ideal system differ from fabric? Um, thank you for asking that mm -hmm. question. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so, yeah, I think you tied my tongue there. <laughs> <Try next time. laughs> we can hold it for later. <laughs> <laughs> um, So what we actually do is we actually um, select an ideal system, mm -hmm. and the one which is used is uh, is a um, is a is a bulletin board system. And in this case, all the parties can post to the trusted bulletin board, mm -hmm. um, which can be viewed by all the, all other parties. So it's almost like we I think we we, we take a model which is. The, it doesn't have privacy. We start from that, and then we layer in the technologies, such as um, encryption and zero knowledge proofs, and, and later on we'll see segmentation. Let's come back to. Okay. Maybe to try and make, to answer your question, to make the concept more concrete. Okay. This is why I already covered this. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we use the bulletin board system as the ideal solution for supply chain factoring described previously. Um, we can imagine a solution that works as follows, where a user sends the encrypted message to the board, the board the posted, makes it available to the participants in, in encrypted form. The bulletin board is also responsible for ordering the messages as they come in, which is kind of like what, what Fabric is, is doing the order, with its ordering and in, in encryption. Um, <clears throat> the commonly used uh, technologies that we have here is we have the segmented ledgers, um, we have the zero knowledge proofs, we have trusted hardware, uh, we have multi-party computation and uh, homograph, homo homomorphic uh, functional encryption, and we have also have uh, decentralized off-chain storage. So those are kind of the, the common technologies. Um, Uh, with segmentation, what we're doing is we, we can encrypt the data, we have unencrypted data, we can see de data going by, and uh, we have different project handle, different, different project handle segmentation differently. Um, so this is kind of why when it gets down to the, um, to the actual implementation and the choice of a, of a project, um, this is why these issues are, are important here because you say, for example, um, Baroja uh, doesn't encrypt the data. And so um, if, if having, if you probably, if you're in, in a healthcare situation, encrypting your data is probably almost like a, a given that you'll do that. Um, okay, <coughs> so uh, <coughs> we, oh, the more sophisticated projects like Fabric actually allow us to do to do the ma manage the, the, the on-chain state, um, and that's really the job of each uh, hyperledger platform to one degree or another. Even though they're in, in the same greenhouse, um, they have these different capabilities. Um, this is the uh, I think one of the latest projects to be added to underneath the umbrella 
is the hypoallergic, I think it's pronounced, is it Bezu? Yeah, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. um, which is really the extension of fabric to, um, to, to extend to the theory. Um, so the technologies we just mentioned, so what happens here, conceptually, the enclave is set up secure, which is kind of like, this is kind of a pretty important. In other words, the, the, when he says the enclave, we're actually talking about the, the CPU uh, inside, inside, inside the, the server. So that's, that's secure. Um, keys are, are transferred into, inside the enclave. So since it's a secure enclave, I can, I can put some keys inside that. Um, <clears throat> we know that, that Alice and Bob sent 10,000 transactions. Special addresses uh, can be used. We can also change the addresses to, 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 to keep things more secure. We can watch the private enclave. Um, everyone in the privacy group has access to the to it to the information. So we set up a group. The, the only that group has information to that um, to that information. The sender sends the private payload into the enclave, and as of version 1.2, this is Fabric. Only um, it only supports networks that uh, that support finality, no proof of work. So it's kind of like just a little example there. Um, so anyways, that's towards the evaluation. That was kind of like the intro. Um, then what I've got here um, is a little Luxy. Um, the paper uses what's called the analytical framework. So I'm going to, that bit was can they prepare this? No, I'm going to like off the cuff. <laughs> Actually, what I'd like to show first is the um, is well. One of the things I'd like to show is that different people who are experts in different areas of the technologies have been contributing and are still contributing to this. For example, Hart, who's um, senior researcher at uh, Fujitsu, is kind of more of an expert and really expert in the security has been focusing on the uh, zero knowledge proofs. That's like a huge, humongous area. And so anyways, one of the neat things about some of these uh, top, top senior people is they can boil things down to just a couple of sentences. Mm -hmm. So you can get the value uh, without actually, you know, being an expert in cryptographic proofs. Um, this, is, and this is another thing we're trying to elevate with the paper is here. We're trying to make the paper that it's consumable by sort of like a, a general audience, you know, who's thinking about CTO issues, but not necessarily deep, deep experts in, in, in cryptography. Um, um, I think I'm going to come back to this issue a little bit over here before I look at some of the specific projects. The segmenting ledgers are really um, how. Uh, the uh, hyperledger blockchain projects are perhaps different than some other projects. In so much it's by doing the segmentation, that's how we're able to uh, to restrict who has access to certain information at certain times. And and then there are uh, cryptographic uh, protocols that are applied to each one of those uh, segments, such as you know encrypting the data or not encrypting the data, using zk proofs, not using zk proofs. And the same happens not only on the ledger, but also of the contracts themselves. So the contracts, we can secure the contract. We can also provide access to the, to the contract for a certain period of time. Uh, we can. Okay. Um, this trusted hardware is kind of an important because this is the, um, this is, this is kind of the, uh, 
the issue that cropped up, I think about two years ago now, where the, um, the, the x86 processes that power a lot of the service had been optimized um, <coughs> for um, to do Luca head processing. And what they found out is that um, they've been optimized in such a way that when they're actually, when the memory is uh, doing this Luca head, it's actually in, in an unencrypted state. So if you've got a key sitting there while the data is in an unencrypted state, then it's pretty easy to uh, scrape that key off and, <clears throat> and then to, to hack a system. So this is where um, the, uh, this is where uh, trusted hardware comes into play. And okay, such as Intel's SGX processes. So I think it's, um, especially if you set up a, a permission network uh, on, a, on a cloud provider, <coughs> And you're going to have uh, different business participants from a federation. You'd want to choose uh, or do some digging around to make sure that they've got these SGX processes. So, for example, when you uh, when you use I, I believe when you use IBM's servers, they've all they've all got these SGX processes. But if you just shop around and go, you know, your startup and go a little bit. Um, look for the lowest cost, you probably wouldn't find that level of security there, which may or may not matter depending on what your adversarial model is. You know, if you're not dealing with people trying to hack you all the time, then probably yeah, it just, that's fine. Um, <clears throat> let me, um, talk a little bit about decentralized on-chain storage. Um, so <clears throat> this is uh, earlier this year I was at the, uh, probably with a couple of folks here in the room, I was at the Truffle Conference <laughs> over, over Microsoft and <clears throat> it looks as if Microsoft is actually reorganizing parts of um, of its blockchain platform and for example one of the things that became apparent was they have this sort of a concept of like three columns they have the, uh, the small contract column where the business logic is in the small contract but also the uh, the segmentation logic is in the small contract so <clears throat> I can have logic from my business you know what happens under certain conditions do we do we um, do we do we uh, agree to agree to execute on a con supply chain contract? But then another one is <clears throat> what else? I, what else I can put into into the small contract is I, I can also uh, put into the small contract um, what the sharing is of the data, so the, the timeliness and whether the data is shared or not. And the third thing I can actually do with hyperledge, certain hyperledger projects is I can actually propagate both of those and upgrade the network itself through, through the small contract. So that's the first column. The second column um, is they're actually building around traditional SQL databases. So the second column is a traditional SQL database. Um, so within that database, there may be this kind of... Um, allows us to have some <clears throat> um, um, commonality with current business systems. And the third column, the third, the third column is really is the blockchain itself. So what I can actually do is I can have my business logic and, and my segmentation logic and my upgrade logic in, in, in my small contracts. Then I can have this data store, which is probably I may that may be a legacy data store, but then the other side of that is I've got a blockchain that will actually share business between my business partners. And so that, that three column model is, uh, that appeared to me to be, you know, 
where they were, where they were, where they how they sort of rearrange things or were looking at things, and so when it comes to choosing an hyperledger project, um, you might say, okay, well, uh, fabric is you know is, has a lot of bells and whistles that fits into that for my adversarial model. On the other hand, maybe Ethereum is, is adequate, and and because it will. And, and then, or, or another, for example, Swooting might be. So, so, one thing we uh, we added into the paper to try and produce some, because there's a lot of text in the paper, one thing we wanted to do was to try and tabulate some things, tabulate so you could actually look at it and see what the differences are. Uh, so we're kind of we have got that underway right now. So, um, but I think we were doing that with respect to the capabilities, um, you know, Fabric, Sawtooth, Aroa, Burrow, Nidi. We've kind of got those five projects there. Um, which projects protect the data? Which projects protect communication? Which projects pr protect uh, identity? Um, and then, and then, uh, which products? Um, have extensions, um, which have uh, trusted execution platforms, which projects use TLS for communications, and so forth. Um, It looks like we have a table here which is currently underway but being filled in. So one of the things that came up here is um, is that a lot of the engineers that are focused on building the projects uh, that's kind of like their complete focus. They have no <laughs> even though they're under the greenhouse and everything because everything's open source, it's shared. Um, their focus is on the products and it's not always on um, uh, amplifying what the differences are in the products. So that's another reason we wrote, we wrote the paper. And another reason the paper, uh, a couple of the, uh, the original instigators wrote the paper was um, a lot of people are proud of their products and um, might feel that their products are completely secure under all conditions, <laughs> um, but based on the analysis and using some of the uh, the academic approaches, that's probably not the case. So it's useful, particularly uh, I think, to you know to 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 kind of consider that this paper is helpful to the evaluation of the, of the projects and also the projects. Another thing we're doing with the project is the information that I presented so far, we kind of kind of put that onto the Hyperledger Wiki as a uh, as sort of an intro. But then each one of the projects, because they are dynamic and because they have engineers continually changing things, for example, I mean, somebody may have added ZK proofs to their, to their products or added the, the addition of the identity, which is, and that could be like coming out with the next release. So we're going to make that sort of like a um, each of the product have its own sort of wiki form. So it's a living document rather than a, uh, a white paper, which will um, uh, go out to date at a, you know an early date. Okay. So um, one of the other things we did was we met with uh, the engineers in each of the projects and we came up with the summary of pros and cons, such as um, with Sawtooth um, and the overview of the capabilities um, and Aroha. And it's kind of interesting because a couple of these projects are, Aroha is based in Japan. and. Uh, I took on the, um, 
I took I took the uh, the re research of that because in order to, to you know to, to to get the overview of capabilities and what the pros and cons of the product were, so it took some digging around in order to get this in, to elevate this information so we could make those the differences. Um, see what the differences were. Um, the same with Indy um, and with Borrow. With, um, so most of the folks you'll see uh, in these double brackets here are really the, the CTOs or the, uh, the original engineers for those products. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I think that's probably mostly what I what I have uh, available to present. I'm happy to kind of try and answer any questions, but um, some of this you now is kind of like just at the tail end here is a little bit, you know, I think, uh, additional issues to consider, so it's kind of where we'll wander it off or we'll like to mm -hmm. cut that off. So that, that's, thanks, mm -hmm. that's, that's the paper. How long have you been working on it? Um, I've been working on the, uh, I've been working on this for about, uh, for about probably 18 months now, and the other folks who start to kick this off they were really motivated because they were the, you know, the sort of like the search engineers behind the products, and they're really mo motivated because <clears throat> uh, because each of these projects competes in the commercial world, mm -hmm. and everybody in blockchain wants to have like super super secure blockchains, but in the uh, in the real real world. Because these each of these systems um, <clears throat> uh, can be attacked by different adversaries and, and uses different methods, um, uh, the systems are, ha, ha, do have some uh, approaches that you can use to attack them. So we wanted to uh, to try and produce an educational paper that's con fairly consumable uh, to just show what the differences are. It may be, um, and also the approach to keeping it a living document rather than having a, a, a sort of a white paper, sort of like a Bitcoin type paper that's you know, just set in, in stone from the date it was published. That kind of came over, I just probably say over the last few months because we were like talking to the engineers and then we couldn't always get like the, the information because the projects still compete against each other a little bit. So to get some of, to get hold of some of the information was a little bit like uh, took some took quite, took quite a bit of persuasive effort and, and, and chasing around. Um, so that's why we ended up with this approach of uh, a living document. Mm -hmm. So, uh, other questions? Yeah. So when you started to talk about Microsoft and mm -hmm. you know, your attendance at the recent conference mm -hmm. and the different pillars in which they were kind of thinking through their approach for the platform, they use or they support Hyperledger um, and I think Enterprise Ethereum mm -hmm. and I think R3 Corda is the most recent announcement. It seems to me that that has some real value if you could expand the scope of what you're doing to include those within the umbrella mm -hmm. of what Microsoft is doing. I know the scope of what you're doing is within the hyperledger group, but is any thought or consideration given to expanding that? Because I think people would really appreciate what you've done here, but in that expanded form. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I, I definitely have, that's crossed my mind a couple of times, but the other, the other thing that's also uh, come up is that some of these folks that are working on this paper now, uh, the lead engineers who are driving you know, some pretty significant engineering teams or the research behind them, and they just want to finish this darn paper up. <laughs> don't don't expand. Don't expand yeah. it any further. Right. We just want to 
you know, right. anywhere you can see there's a little edit in here where we're like, let's <laughs> this darn paper up and publish it. And that was the reason why it was like, hey, let's take the, um, the method of approach, um, let's make that a kind of a, 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 a more frozen wiki document, but mm -hmm. then let's make a page for each of the projects so that they can be updated. But I think it would be really useful, uh, especially to, um, to to have some analysis, you know, for for the approach that Microsoft is apparently taking, which is where they recognize that coexistence is really important. And it's really hard to kind of just ask somebody to just pull out their business system and just put in a blockchain-based system, especially when it doesn't have you know, a lot of the capabilities that current system has. But if you can make it coexist, then that's a pretty sweet thing because then you can start to do some things like that Musk would like to do, which is like share production data. And if you can share production data, you can get rid of some of those cultural differences between the managements. And then if you can do that in the batteries, it means you can probably do it for healthcare and for some other you know, other in, other segments as well. Uh, certified true, right? Yep. As you work on this, you know, what tools or what architectures or how does that map to what you're currently doing with, you know, your use case? That's a good question because <clears throat> certified true is uh, kind of a little bit in, in limbo right now. We didn't really um, get to scale. You could call it, you know, to, you know, to, sure. you know. So, uh, Certified True has been purchased by a, uh, a group which is working on a Facebook Libra type uh, mm -hmm. system. Currency or system or social system? What can you say? Uh, no, I, I guess I can say mm -hmm. uh, a. Um, the, uh, some executives who have got really a lot of experience in the old banking scene. Mm -hmm. They would like to um, to have the capabilities of a, uh, uh, a cryptographic currency to go along with just traditional banking. And so <coughs> we were. Certified True was much more about producing blockchains, especially to certify real estate and uh, to insurance assets on the chain. Mm -hmm. But that didn't. We always came in second instead of like winning the prize, where you ended up like with a lot of gold <laughs> to go off and, and develop to the next level, and so. So I, I guess our CTO, CEO, and CTO uh, uh, had to explore some other options. I mean, folks, folks want to buy these types of uh, technologies, and, and, and also want want to acquire the, the team's expertise as well. Because when you bounce around in these technologies, and you're, and you're you've been hands on with them for a while, you've actually produced something, even if it hasn't been commercially successful, and you kind of acquired some. Uh, useful skills and, and know-how that it's valuable to other folks for you know for something that is probably backed by you know, better backers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, yes. Clive. Sure. Really appreciate it. Okay. Uh, just so everybody knows, our next meeting will be back here November twelfth. We have uh, Zach. Um, he's from Denver and Zua, um, sorry, Denver, Colorado, with a company called Zua, and he'll be looking at real-world experiences with building on Hyperledger. So it'll be another more technically focused uh, conversation. We're kind of rounding the year with a little bit more, getting a little bit more in the weeds. So thanks so much for coming. Really appreciate it.